Let me go ahead and record this. Uh, when the Electronic Frontiers Foundation came and decided that they wanted to try to crack DES in 1998, uh, they tried to predict what the work factor would be to try to defeat the time and resources required to defeat the encryption system. So uh, C is the best answer here. C is the best answer here. All right, why might an organization choose RSA algorithm instead of the Advanced Encryption Standard, or AES. Doug, yes. Great job. We can definitely get rid of one here. Definitely get rid of one. Actually, we can get rid of two. Two of them. Yes, Alicia. Ryan, no. Amos, no. That's okay. You know, you, you, you get the next one, you get the next one, you get the next one. We call that a streak, baby. You know? All right. Let me help here. So this one, let's just take a look at it here. We got a couple that got it. Uh, so I'm just reading this here, choose RSA. RSA is asymmetric, right? And AES is symmetric, right? So RSA, symmetric, AES is asymmetric. So RSA is based on symmetric algorithm. You can get rid of that one, right? AES is not a proven technology. Well, yeah, it is. Yes, it is. So now we got these two right here. AES is symmetric, so the proof of origin tells us non-repudiation. Right? I don't know why they just don't say non-repudiation. They try to trick you, but uh, AES does not provide proof of origin. That is correct, because it's symmetric. Only asymmetric algorithms give us confidentiality and integrity. Symmetric only gives us confidentiality, okay? So since this is AES, it's symmetric, it doesn't give us the integrity or proof of origin. All right. Hopefully everyone gets this next one. But no pressure here. No pressure. Well, there you are, Jennifer. I wonder where you went. Doug, yes. Ryan, yes, good. Alicia, yes, good. Jennifer, yes. Yes, Amos, great job there. Yeah, the answer is blowing in the wind, right? Is a dictionary attack. Fantastic job. Fantastic job.
How about this one? This one's kind of tough. Jennifer, yes. Doug, yes. Amos, yes. Brandon, no. Alicia, yes. Ryan, no. answer here is the skilled staff think about anybody on the phone or anybody on the on the horn right now have any uh experience implementation with the implementation of pki anybody negative is correct oh a bit okay yeah usually people that understand how to implement pki um usually those are in pretty high demand uh, you can probably get 135 to 165 you know or if we're looking at it from a consultant perspective that would be what 6750 respect or per hour or 82.50 in my experience oh student wow you've been sleeping for the past couple of days here where you been student all right skilled staff good <laughs> that's funny that's funny amos all right um oh this one's good oh yeah this is good Jennifer, yes. Doug, no. Brandon, yes. Alicia, yes. Ryan, that a boy. Yes. Uh huh. So look at the look at the word there, Doug, that you picked, and then look at some of the other ones. There's a context clue in one of the other answers. Yes, good job, Amos. Yeah, the hashing function is for integrity purposes. Every no pressure here, no pressure. Every one of you motherfathers online right now should get this one. Especially you, Jennifer. That is correct, good. Ryan, excellent.
Brandon, excellent. Doug, yes. Alicia, yes. Yes, good job, Amos. All right, uh, hashing tested for vulnerabilities. We call that a birthday attack. For 1 billion points, 1 billion points, we also said hashes, there is a, and something else that is called the blank effect that tries to make sure that the value that you put in is totally different. What is that? Yes, Jennifer. <laughs> That's funny, Doug. That's funny. That tells me you know the answer though, man. <laughs> if you can do that, then that tells me you know the answer. Ryan, yes, good. Brandon, no, that's remember that's what the the that's what this tries to to prove. Try to avoid collisions by having this effect. So you're in the ballpark. The birthday attack forces that collision, right? But this effect, this blank effect. Um, I always think about uh, um, yes, Alicia, good. Yeah, avalanche, the avalanche effect. Avalanche effect is what we were looking for there. All right, um, let's see here. What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? How much? What, what time do I got here? Um, okay, we'll do. We'll do a couple more. This is a good one. Ryan, no. Alicia, no. So I look at this one personally. Most of these cryptography, that's why we were saying earlier on the week that it's good to know that crypto bucket, right? Most of these cryptography questions, you know the crypto bucket and you know how they they word it, then you should be able to look at the context clue and figure out what are they asking for, right? So this one, this says a public key. So I immediately think of PKI and asymmetric when I see those that right there, asymmetric, right? And then I think to myself, okay. Derek Jeter. And then I know that 23 braids for symmetric, two fish is not in there. El Gamal is one of the E's, right? Fiat Shamir, nope. And then uh, DEA, that's what DES is based off of, which is symmetric. So the answer has to be C here. No, public key is asymmetric. The public key cryptography, public key infrastructure, that's asymmetric. Remember, that's a um, keyed pair. Okay. 
All right, probably one of the easier ones here is this next one. Ryan, yes. Doug, one out of two. Jennifer, yes. Hey, buddy. How are you doing? How are you doing, big fella? Hmm? Are you doing okay? Hmm? You doing okay? Uh, so, yeah, this one, it could be could be a couple of them, but nope, it's only one of them. I'm just saying, here, buddy. Sorry, my dog. <laughs> All right. Uh, so this one is uh, substitution and transposition. Delta. All right, let's do uh, one more here. One more. I mean, all, all these are really good. I like things. All right, the digital signature standard. Digital signature. We said digital signatures are what? So don't answer the question with the the a b c or d here i remember we, we talked about digital signatures are what put that into the chat window what are digital signatures yeah yeah but essentially they're yes doug yes so now doug you answer the question you should be able to answer that question yes ryan yes alicia um, but uh, yeah, no, no, that's so the digital signature, check it out. Let me see if I can draw it here. <clears throat> so the way that this works is, you know, we have a message, right? What we're going to do is we're going to take our private key and we're going to add the private key and then add these two together and then we're going to get we're going to put it into an algorithm Right. And then that's going to generate the the digital signature. Right. So another name for the digital signature is the hash. And so what we do is we take that digital signature. And we add it to the message. So look at this right here. So the message plus the private key, we throw that into the algorithm that generates the digital signature, the hash, and then we add the digital signature to the message. And then so the message now is tightly coupled with the, the hash. So the hash is here. 
and the message is here. And we call that the digital signature. So if the message changes at all, the hash changes. Remember I brought up the hash calculator? So if, the, if, you know, if it goes from hello to all lowercase now, well, the, the message has changed. So now these two will have different hash, hashes. This will be a different hash and this will be a different hash. All right, so what's, what's the answer here now that I kind of have gone through it? This is a little tricky here. This is a little it's tricky. It's, it says it's based on, based on. Now, for me, I kind of look at it, okay, it's not confidentiality, right? Uh, protection from its disclosure message recipients, no. So now we got a 50-50. And, you know, for me, I, I like A. Uh, but it's based on usually the SHA. That's what digital signatures are usually based on. And so of these two, Bravo is the better answer. Even though this says, you know, we can't deny it here. Uh, the, the issue here that you may have overlooked if you picked A is the delivery, right? It's not delivery that the non-repudiation is. Right? What's what's the non-repudiation of? Anybody? It's not it's not of delivery, which is kind of tricky that they they throw that in there and word it that way, right? Yeah, it's it's of the, it's from the sending person, the person that sends it, not delivering it. It's not like a read receipt or anything like that. It basically, hey, I'm signing it. This is my signature. I send it. So that's kind of tricky. It's kind of tricky the way that that's worded. Uh, Bravo is the best answer here. All right, let's do one more of these. Uh, these should be available in some of the games on the Cyber Ninja, all of these. You know what? I want to do two more. These. I want to do this one. Now read this carefully, guys. So like anytime you get these crypto ones, it, you got to read them. You got to read them carefully. You got to make sure you understand what type of encryption it's asking about. Boom, Jennifer. Excellent. Excellent. Doug, yes. All right. So, uh, what's this? What is this asking us for here? What's this asking us for? So, prior to establishing a secure, symmetric, right? So, if we look at this, symmetric means. We're, we're establishing a symmetric, so we're going to share a key. What must he take place? Um, the answer here is key negotiation. Why? Why is it key negotiation and not public key exchange? When I see these two words together, public and key together, I 100% of the time, I think asymmetric cryptography, these two together. And they deliberately will try to trick you like that. 
All right, let's do one more. This is uh, this will be the last one right here. Remember the, the great wizard of Oz, right? Great wizard of Oz right here. Yes, Amos, great job. Doug, yes. <clears throat> Brandon, yes. Ryan, no. Jennifer, yes. All right, so remember the certificate authority is the Grand Puba, right? That's the, the one up top here. Um, and then anybody who wants to be within that security boundary, that realm of trust or that web of trust, what they must do is they must go through the RA to get to the CA, the registration authority. And then the CA, once it receives the enrollment request, right, from the RA, it will register and distribute the public key certificate. So it will it'll re register and distribute the keyed pair, the private and public key, to the person requesting it. So does it enforce message integrity? Um, No, that's not the like the that's not the best answer here. Uh, I look at this this one right here. Ensure all confidential messages are encrypted prior to uh, distribution. No, all right. Provide a secure distribution for symmetric keys. We could we could eliminate these two. And now we're down to these as the possible answers. Uh, you know, A is the better of the two. So A is the best answer here. So the registration authority, registration authority will submit, it's almost like they're submitting the paperwork for you, right? They, they submit, they're the proxy between you and the, uh, the CA. And yeah, the way that this is worded, I don't know if I would have worded it myself that way. Uh, I probably wouldn't have put the word registration in here, but in fact, that's what the CA does. The registration doesn't register you. They'll send the paperwork up to the CA and then the CA will register and distribute the public key. Yeah, I don't like those choices of words on this one. Yeah, I, I think, you know, let's, let's, I want to end it with, with a good one here. Let's end it with this one. That's a good one. Jennifer, yes. Fantastic job. Doug, yes. Alicia, yes. Ryan, fantastic job. So which of the following is an advantage of elliptical curve cryptography? I, I take a look at this and, you know, with any question, like if I was taking any test out there, I would immediately look for those absolutes. And, uh, you know, I see not here. I don't even care what the what the actual question is asking. I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and get rid of it unless I can't find another answer. And then I might come back to it. 
Uh, I look at these other ones, it provides digital signatures as well as encryption. Um, no, I think RSA does. RSA provides digital signatures as well as encryption. Uh, so D is out, C is out, Bravo is the better answer here for those, okay? Bravo is the better answers for those. Hey, go ahead. All right, so I'm planning to go for about another half hour here and then we'll, we'll conclude it. Um, so I don't think I need a break. If you guys need a break, you can go and take one. I'm gonna keep on trucking though. Um, so let me go ahead and share this out. Let me sure. Oh, I'm on the beach now. That's cool. How about that one? That one. This this one looks a little more uh, professional. Let me turn the TV down in the back here. All right, let's keep on going. All right, so when we jump into this next domain, the uh, security assessment and testing, this one is one that many of you probably are familiar with, some of the things that we're gonna be going through here. Um, but then again, you, you may not be, so I'm gonna spend some time uh, going through it to make sure that we all understand it. But uh, it's, it's really a, a great domain. Uh, it gives us some of the most important elements of security ass assessments and testing. Um, you know, there's, there's components here within security assessments and testing. You know, I think about there's auditors out there, uh, there's different strategies for uh, for auditing. There's uh, testing the technical security controls. Uh, testing the administrative controls, which is probably one of the, the um, less technical, but more time consuming ones, administrative controls, um, but it, maybe not difficult, uh, but looking at policies. Um, and then we look at how we can test the security posture, like through a pen test. of the organization. So to test the posture of the organization. All right. <clears throat> so those are what we're looking to do here. And by doing that, we're able to um, look at the different testing strategies, the, like I was saying before, the security controls, how some of the, the management and operational controls, as well as the reports, uh, how many are manual, how many are, are automated, and then, um, you know, being able to understand what the types of third-party assessments are. Uh, if you don't already know, that is uh, something that you may be interested in. Uh, so why, why is that important? Well, if we want to go through and try to think about it from a, a high-level uh, perspective, if we're going to look into design and validate any type of a, a testing assessment or strategies, you got to come up with what's called the ROI, right? This is going to be the return on investment. 
And sometimes we call it the ROSI. That's right, ROSI. And that's going to be the return on security investment. And so some people that are in security use that instead of that. But either way, we play to win. And so the, the, the goals that we're looking to establish, we typically will go through and um, look at different types of testing that's out there. And when we are hoping to define what we typically will call scope, we'll need to make sure that we understand the differences or the deltas between the different types of assessment. A penetration test is an active exploitation, an active exploitation. of known vulnerabilities. So a pen test typically will include a vulnerability assessment as well. Usually, it will include a vulnerability assessment. Whereas a, a vulnerability assessment here, let me just change colors so we can all be on the same page. Vulnerability assessment uh, is more of a passive test that collects information and really provides findings for known issues. And so, like I said, the, the difference here is active and passive. A pen test will include a vulnerability assessment, but not vice versa. And when we're going in and doing this, we need to define the scope and the scope typically are, you know, what subnets are we looking at? Um, what systems are we gonna be testing? What artifacts are we looking at? Do you want us to take a look at, you know, some of the artifacts? Um, you know, passwords, you want us to, to look at log files? Uh, you want us to try to do social engineering? Um, what are the privacy do we you want us to go in and, and take a look at some of the the different privacy impl uh, implications here uh, and you know what about some of the processes as our friends up in Canada say or as we say here the processes right so these are some of the things that help us to clearly lay out our scope and answering these questions will make life a lot easier. So if we're going in and uh, looking at or looking at an audit or trying to, to help define the scope with any business unit manager or anybody that's involved in the organization that can can help us, uh, and we forget about you know different scenarios or business cases, uh, it may take a lot longer than the scope that we had uh we had you know hope for scope drives cost because you know the more things you got to look at the more that it's going to cost right so labor is one of the most important things and uh really you know from a a, a corporation's perspective you know, one of the things that you have to first and foremost figure out is do you want to do some sort of self assessment right do you want to have an internal team do it or do you want to have you know a third party right third party uh, probably going to cost a lot more but uh you know uh, you, you, you get what you pay for. Get what you pay for. 
So usually, usually when we're going through and doing a, uh, an audit of some kind, um, let me go back. That went for. We're going through and doing an audit. We want to make sure that we clearly define the goals, that we have senior leadership involved, You know, I typically will will make sure we spend a lot of time hammering out scope and also, more importantly, figuring out, you know, what kind of budget they have, but also how far out they're looking to get it done. Uh, we then need to choose our, our team within our organization, you know, because we may have different people that, that bring to, to the table different things. Uh, or maybe we have, uh, we got to hire a consultant from the outside to help us out. Um, so we choose the team and then, you know, from there we'll go through and put together a schedule and plan it. So plan the audit, you know, put together a schedule, figure out when we can, we can get them in to the, the HAPA, you know, cause you may, you may already be booked for next month or something. And then we'll actually go through and conduct it. So conduct the audit. And as we're, do as we're doing that, we're going to document what's happening. And hopefully, hopefully be able at the end and probably the most important thing is how are we going to be able to communicate the results now why do i say that's the most important thing there well usually some people will provide senior executives with you know a hundred page assessment or an audit right well chances of them reading that hundred page audit is uh, next to none so what we typically will do is we'll provide a few different options. We'll give some sort of executive summary in the communication process, right? So executive summary. And, you know, maybe there's a, uh, a more detailed report that they could read if they really wanted to. But usually the executive summary is, uh, you know, typically... Uh, what the exec, what what senior management or senior leadership is looking for. Uh, so that's important. That's important because uh, depending on you know what regulatory pr uh, compliance or parameters that the audit uh, or you may have to perform really could come in handy. We were doing one recently on a a new device that's coming to. To market and um, you know we we had all the expertise on on staff but uh, you know we we hadn't ever played around with that particular piece of hardware before so we put in a little bit extra time to make sure that we could spin up on it uh, had some some Linux folks on the team to you know ensure that uh, there's some in, innovation and creativity uh, with ha just in case we need to figure stuff out. So uh, that really kind of drives everything is who, who can you get on your team? Who can you get on your team? And so, you know, this is all important when we're going through and, and making that, we're starting to bring that to life, right? So with a vulnerability assessment, again, that you, we, we talked about this earlier and the difference, remember, is this is a passive a passive assessment. We're just finding stuff. We're not actually putting our hands through the wall. We're just kind of coming up. We're touching the wall, maybe poking a finger through the, the, the beginning of the wall and then getting out. Uh, usually with the vulnerability assessment, you know, we're going to scan for any security weaknesses that are out there. 
And what we may do is we may do uh, screenshots. And maybe even a, a proof of concept. Where we're not actively doing anything, but if we can get it to behave in a way that we know that it is, uh, we could actively exploit it, then we want to document that in the, the vulnerability assessment. Usually the tools that we uh, will utilize will be IP enabled. Uh, they'll be able to enumerate nodes on the network. And uh, in addition, they'll look at operating systems, maybe what apps that are out there, any misconfiguration, because that's one of the biggest issues that we see is, you know, people stand up systems really, really quickly, and then you know, they kind of leave it wide open after it gets done working. So we'll go through and, and see how it's configured. Um, you know, do they have uh just basic security installed on it um are they using default passwords and the like um you know because that's important that's important for us to, to help document that and you know when we do find something when we do find something we can do a little bit of additional research to provide what's uh, more information on each vulnerability based off of this common vulnerabilities and exposure, the CVEs. And um, this is from the National Vulnerability Database that you can go out and take a look at on your own accord, cve.mitre.org. Uh, but this is pretty interesting. And uh, basically every issue that's out there has a CVE and you can go and see that there's 144,216. So there's quite a bit. You can come in and look at the different CVE, the the, the entries. Usually they'll have a, a date that they were associated and then numerically, excuse me, what, uh, what number throughout the year that it is. Uh, so you can you can go and do that research on your own accord to add some some salt and pepper to your report to give it a little bit more uh, value added. Uh, and that's you know, looking at those common vulnerabilities could lead to attacks. You can do a threat model inside of there um, with some you know, postulating that, hey, we think that it might do this. We think we could, we could probably get it to do that. Uh, so keep that in mind. But one of the most important things here that we need to mention is with a vulnerability assessment, if you've never done one before, that it is just a snapshot in time just a snapshot of time. And that may be kind of Captain Obvious right there, but uh, you know, if it is just a snapshot in time, that means that uh, you know, if these vulnerabilities exist today, uh, if, if you don't fix them, then you know, we do another vulnerability assessment six months down the road, it's likely that it will cascade. So you'll have, you know, let's say 50 vulnerabilities for the first time that we do it. Well, those 50 vulnerabilities down the road, those will still be there. And maybe there'll be another you know, 25 to give you 75 total. Now we're looking at a, a huge project to try to fix this stuff. So, you know, from that, uh, the, the idea to go in and do these regularly uh, usually every um, 90 days, every quarter is a, is a good time, good estimate. Uh, that won't be on the exam. I'm just telling you best practice. That's typically what we see 90 days or, you know, quarterly for vulnerability assessment. Um, and we have a lot of return customers that, that just have us do that or a wrong retainer for, for some folks. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that uh, what we're not going to do is we're not going to just run Nmap and then provide you the report for Nmap, right? That's not what we're going to do uh, because that doesn't really do anything except just tell you you know what ports are open. Uh, that may be one component, a port scanner, but also you know using other 
vulnerability scanners or protocol analyzers. Uh, you know, one of the best ones on the marketplace is Nessus. And another one is by Rapid7, Nexpose. Uh, both of those go out and do a great job with, uh, you know, combing the, the, the network to, to make sure that uh, not only does it map it, but uh, gives you uh, probabilities on, you know, exploitation opportunities. So that really, uh, those particular tools come in handy if you uh, have some money to invest in that. I think uh, a license of Nessus is right around 2,500 bucks per year. And you can get up to uh, 256 scans with, with that. Uh, Next pose, I think is right around $5,500. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit better. But typically, you know, we'll recommend to customers to go out and purchase Nessus, and then we'll come and run it and then uh, interpret the report for each of those customers. Uh, so with, with the, the, the penetration test, uh, typically with a vulnerability assessment, a penetration test, or any type of security audit, you know, there's going to be some some contractual things that we're going to do. We're going to enter into an NDA, right? Because we don't want to share stuff with people. Um, the vulnerability assessment could be manual or automated. And usually what we're trying to do here with these security assessments is we're trying to, to come up with a, a resolution here that tells what the true security posture is of the organization. Now, one thing that we don't want to do, we don't want to cry wolf, right? We don't want to just say, hey, the sky is falling, your, your network sucks, you, uh, you should just shut it down, right? We do not want to cry wolf. We want to make sure that we are able to give an honest evaluation and then uh, kind of like what we were saying before on, I think, Monday or Tuesday is provide that, that heat map with, you know, maybe a top 10. And, you know, you have your, your red, yellow, and green, the traffic light kind of areas right here um, based off of impact and likelihood, those uh, 10 priorities that they need to focus on. And what we want to do is when we're – when we're going out and doing a, a penetration test is we first come up and we'll, we'll do the vulnerability scans on the network, but then uh, we want to test how systems react, test how systems react to certain circumstances. And with a pen test, the pen test is going to be an active exploitation. So, you know, not only in the NDA, but we also have this thing that's called a rules of engagement. The engagement. Where essentially, uh, you get the get out of jail free card here with the rules of engagement to say, hey, what needs to be tested? And hey, what are your goals for that? What are you hoping to, to get out of it? And then you know, defining that scope, what systems really drives the price, but also which locations that you have to do. Uh, you know, we need to make sure that the, any, any you know, ramifications are all identified and agreed upon uh, because if you know we run some of our tools whether it's the vulnerability assessment tools or some of these other tools that are out there um, you know it could take some of these assets down and knock them offline we could totally knock assets uh, 
offline. Uh, but in addition to that, you know, what are some of the, those testing points there? Um, with with the pen test, do we want to maybe do a uh, also, you know, invoke a personnel testing? Um, you know, maybe interviewing the the employees and and finding out, you know, if people will let us in. Uh, you know, maybe some sort of physical test right there. I had a physical test, uh, maybe wireless. You know, there's a whole bunch of different things that we can do, social engineering. And um, the, you know, the most important one typically is the network, right? Let's go ahead and test the, the network. We can either do an external uh, network penetration test or an internal, which is a little bit easier. But either way, uh, we're playing to win. The external penetration test usually is going to take you uh, anywhere from five to seven days longer, just based off of my experience. Uh, so, you know, that jacks up the price a little bit uh, as opposed to an internal penetration test where you may have credentials uh, that are supplied to you by someone. Uh, so there's there's... There's a whole bunch of different things that we can do when we're jumping into these different security testing. Uh, for purposes of your exam, I would recommend that you, you know, take a look at these three right here, right? The black box, the gray box, and the white box. So the, the white box is usually the metaphor I use here is open kimono where they show their world to you. They'll supply you network topology diagrams. Um, you know, they may give you, you know, uh, key personnel. Uh, you know, they may tell you uh, certain issues about things that they know of. So really, they're, they're showing the world to you here. Uh, gray box testing means that you, you know some, but not all of the intelligence of the network some intelligence of the network. So you're provided some things, whereas, you know, coming in with a black box, I always think about aircraft and, you know, if one goes down that they typically will search for the black box uh, to find out what happens. So basically, uh, you know, black box, you're coming in blind. You have no idea what to expect. Um, and these are all dovetail really into how we we price it but also um you know the the automation can uh drive down the price right if we have automated things we can do it drives down the price if we have manual things that we have to do a lot of manual things it's going to drive up the price uh, i had a friend who was working for a massive data center and they had a um, uh, an auditor come in to the data center. And while my friend was signing in the auditor, um, the auditor apparently, and it wasn't in the scope of work, but the auditor wanted to see what could they, the reaction of my friend and, and his team, uh, if he was to push the, the Molly switch inside of the, the network operations center. And so, you know, my buddy's signing the guy in on the log, you know, that they're getting ready to do a tour of the data center. And while he's signing him in, he had his back turned to him. The guy flips up the Molly switch and he pushes the button and uh, everything in the data center went down. And uh, my friend's like, what in the heck are you doing? And the, Auditor's like, well, I want to see how you guys are going to react. And he's like, we didn't ask you to, to test that. Uh, and so, you know, they were able to bring things up in about uh, most systems up in about 30 minutes. But uh, it was right in the middle of the day. And uh, my friend called security and had uh, the security guards escort that person outside of the building. 
so, you know, it's important that you define the scope and ensure that, hey, when we're doing a, especially when we're doing a, a pen test, right? If we're doing a pen test on someone, we want to prove that an attacker <laughs> yeah, get him out of there. Prove an attacker could uh, could actually compromise the system. Now, on the DoD side, I've been involved with some events before that, um, you know, this right here proved that an attack or an attacker, you know, could actually compromise the system. I've been on some, some stuff that, uh, you know, I don't know if I agree with the techniques that they were used because it's, it's some of the techniques that I've seen some of these guys use are just totally unrealistic. Um, and the key word here is actually, right? Because we could do a whole bunch of things, but, you know, if it's totally unrealistic, then, you know, that's like a snowball's chance in hell. However, if it does work, then, yeah, I guess you could say, well, you know, we had the the organizational objectives, we met the management goals, we we wanted to make sure that you know we provided you what you what you wanted by these different tools and scanning devices uh, because it really depends on what kind of uh, pen test that you're doing. You really need to do your homework to you know do the research. Uh, uh, we typically will call this footprinting and reconnaissance right here. So footprinting and reconnaissance. Uh, and then after the footprinting and reconnaissance, we're going to be uh, trying to do a system of enumeration. Uh, and uh, attack techniques, so hacking. I'm going to use some attack techniques here, various tools. And then, you know, after we've attacked here, um, one of the most important things is, can we keep persistence? So once I'm on, I'm able to compromise something somehow, some way, maybe I'm able to use uh, privilege escalation. So I'm able to, you know, get root access or administrative access to something. And once I get that uh, privilege escalation, then how am I gonna be able to keep persistence? So, you know, if they find me on the system and they bump me off, Am I going to have to start over from scratch? Well, no. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can get root. I'm going to create probably you know a dozen extra user IDs, and then I'm going to create a a little Easter egg where with one of these identities, and then I'm going to hide the Easter egg inside the bowels of the operating system. So uh, maybe underneath the Windows Explorer process, or you know, if it's on a router, maybe in the config file on the router, or look at any sensitive information or uh, things like that. And from that, you know, all those different techniques, then afterwards, now we have, you know, we, we provide a report, but also a uh, mitigation strategy. All right, so the mitigation strategy. What would we do to help fix it? Now that doesn't mean we're going to come in and fix it. We're just giving you the, the, the you know what we would do. And hey, this is this is the intrusive and disruptive things that we were able to do. This is how long that it took. Here's how productive we were. Um, 
you know, uh, this is what we were able to do. And, you know, the, the entire time, we know that with a pen, pen test, that we have a, uh, a get out of jail free card. Right, kind of like the uh, the old monopoly. Because if we do something, and you know, there, it, and especially you know, in the last slide here, if it's unannounced, like if if the, their their leadership says, "Hey, we want you to test without an announcement," well, you know what, we have to get out jail free card. And if we're doing, especially if we're doing on site. Or did I have on site? Like if we're doing personnel testing or physical testing on site, um, you know, depending on where you're going, like if you're doing financial or banking, or if you're trying to to test a government facility, you may end up getting a gun pulled on you, which would suck, right? But at least you have this on your person to say, hey, you know what? Here, check my coat pocket here. You know, I, this is my I got it signed by the the commander and uh you know feel free to to call them right now uh you know i tried to to keep it as uh on the down low as i possibly could but you know what you caught me and that's pretty much uh uh i personally have never had that happen to me um but i do know a few people that that has happened to where they've got a, a gun pulled on before Okay. All right. So you know that uh, that is uh, really one of the um, for a lot of people that are not taking the CISSP, um, the penetration testing is one of the sexiest components for people getting into the business. They want to be a pen tester. I want to be a pen tester, man. And, you know, that just doesn't happen overnight. If you want to be able to, to specialize in something um, uh, like a pen test, well, you're probably going to need to know um, Linux. You're going to probably need to know some sort of programming or scripting language, right? Uh, you probably would need to know uh, PowerShell pretty well. Uh, and, you know, we kind of enumerate each one of these as a, a, uh, a team member, somebody that's on our team that has a specialty in, you know, web applications or, you know, network devices, maybe, you know, wireless or if somebody has a VPN or a radius server, uh, any type of, of uh, phone equipment or uh, if we want to do like uh, a phishing attack or any type of social engineering. Um, you know, firewall, network filtering, or uh, IDS, or you know, HIDs if it's if it's internal or NIDs, right? Uh, and you know, we we have tools that can help us with um, launching a DOS attack through floods, like sin floods, and so we can with one command uh, on a Linux box, I can flood a network and do a, a denial of service. So there's there's quite a bit of different techniques that you can use for pen testing. Um, and you want to make sure that you have everything that you need in your Batman utility belt to uh, not only uh, exercise that get out of jail free card, but also to, to understand, you know, how much you're going to be able to charge the customer uh, what are going to be the service level agreements and the project scope? Who are going to be on your team? And, uh, you know, for, for a lot of us out there, the automation and the ability to be able to, to automate as much as possible, it saves time and saves money. So, you know, if you spend 10 grand on one of these tools down here, which none of those tools cost 10 grand, <laughs> uh, you save time. You know, you're able to save money, but you know, uh, you better if you're going to be buying Fortify for a hundred grand, you better be doing a lot of work using Fortify uh, throughout the year. You know, so that's important to think about as you're going through 
and uh, wanting to, to get into some of these testing, uh, what kind of tools do we use uh, for network scanning? What about wireless? Um, what kind of network filtering devices? Can we use some of these packet generation tools that are out there like Exacta and Aceping 3? Uh, they're quite robust. Um, some have nice GUIs in front of them, others just start from the command line. So uh, you really gotta pick your poison and figure out exactly uh, what you need to do for that particular customer. Uh, any questions so far? We've, we've gone over uh, quite a lot here on this domain. Any questions yet? All right, let's keep on doing it. Uh, just a few more slides and then I'll let you go for the evening. Uh, so being able to, to conduct the security control assessment um, may leave, lead us to certain things. So in the, uh, you know, on uh, if you're looking at maybe a SIM and you're seeing what kind of controls, uh, you know, I think about security controls immediately, I'm thinking about the risk management framework, DFARS and, we are in the first round of companies that will be CMMC certified professionals. So uh, that's something that we're looking forward to in the first part of the year. Uh, but essentially we're coming in and calling your baby ugly, looking for anything that you have uh, in place that may tie back to compliance. You know, that can be HIPAA, uh, that can be PCI DSS, uh, you know, it can be a lot of different things, but not only are we looking at log reviews, but we're looking at all the controls that have been uh, put in place. Uh, just because somebody says something doesn't mean that it actually exists. And um, one of the things or techniques that we may do is learn a little bit about the system and then create these synthetic transactions to see if we can get systems to behave in a certain way. And a lot of times we can. Uh, but in addition to that, we may end up need to do, take a look at the code. And if it's manual, that's gonna take a little bit of time. Uh, typically we can use a static source code ana analyzer that uh, just looks for regular expressions and uh, bad coding practices. Or if we build the program and allow it to run, uh, we can scan it while it's at runtime using a dynamic scan. And uh, in addition to that, we can do what's called a fuzz test, which encompasses uh, a lot of different techniques. And a lot of times you hear people say, you throw with a fuzz test, you throw the kitchen sink at it. Uh, because you wanna make sure that you, you have people that know that this is how the system is supposed to work, but hey, what happens if I push this button and then this button and then this button? Will I get it to behave in a way that I uh, it, I could possibly attack it? Um, what if I push this one first, that one first, you know, this one over here next, and then this one? Um, what does that look like if I push this one, this one, this one? You know, what if it you know, I can get it to behave a little bit differently? And I think probably. The, the best people that are in here in this business are people that are curious, like people that don't mind uh, breaking things and uh, putting them back together. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind. Last thing here that I wanna make sure that we, we talk about is, uh, you know, looking at some of the more management and operational controls here. Uh, these are important. Uh, policies, procedures, backups, training, disaster recovery. Uh, one of the things that you, you probably have seen before are these KPIs, the key performance indicators, the KPIs. Uh, those are things that we would report on and uh, there's a, a litany of those that you, you probably would want to do um, to make sure that you are able to, to show what that output is based off of uh, whether you did a, a automated or a manual type of, of assessment, 
Did you simulate the attacker? What kind of patterns and attack phases did you use? Uh, were you able to fingerprint any systems that they had? Uh, and one of the cool things that if you're interested in doing a little bit of extra research here, uh, the NIST 800-137 actually teaches you how or what is best practice for continuously monitoring. Uh, so anybody that's dealing with RMF, risk management framework, uh, this would be of significant interest to help you get over that hurdle. Uh, because that is just one of the ways that we can require any type of third party audit, you know, have the DCSA person come in, or if you're, if you're doing anything with FISMA or um, any auditing with SAS 70, or maybe you're providing some sort of services and you wanna be a SOC compliant, um, you know, these types of laws that are out there are, it's very cut and dry on what you need to do to, to you know, be able to be compliant. Uh, so keep that in mind as you're going through and conducting these security assessments. All right, so um, I think that that is all that, that I, I wanted to try to cover today. Um, uh, I do have, uh, I think, I know I got the, the software security domain uh, that I want to cover probably first thing in the morning tomorrow, software development security. I also want to hit up on security operations. Uh, and then, you know, the afternoon we can we can uh, take looking at community or communications and network security and hopefully have enough time left for a review. So that's really what my game plan is for tomorrow is to start off probably with software security and uh, security operations. And then, uh, you know, spend a little bit of time on the communications and network security, but I'm gonna try to, to, to wrap it up tomorrow. And um, uh, that's my story, I'm sticking to it. Anybody got any questions for tonight? All the homework is out on the Cyber Ninja. Um, and I'm gonna be posting the videos out there tonight as well. And I'll send you a link for that. Any questions? Yes, I do. I will, I will provide you that information. That's a great question. I'll provide that to you, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. The books are at the office. If you want to pick one up, uh, swing on by. Uh, feel free to. Absolutely. All right. If you don't have any other questions, then uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Um, so, Ryan. I'm gonna, I'll send you an email. We haven't heard anything back yet. We're, hope, we're hopeful we're gonna hear something back. Um, but right now I haven't heard anything back. So uh, it probably will be remote tomorrow um, unless I hear something back. I don't wanna put anybody in harm's way, man. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see, Amos, you had a question on the test. What are we, what about the test? That's a great question. Uh, so we provide a voucher. We'll, we'll provide you a voucher. Um, typically we order them on Friday and then um, they either give them to us tomorrow afternoon or they'll give them to us uh, first thing on Monday morning. And then uh, you'll, go, you'll go out and register for the, for the test. Uh, I will caution you that I think it's $150 to reschedule the exam once you've uh, once you've scheduled it. So uh, make sure that you're serious about the date prior to registering. That makes sense. All right, cool. We'll see you guys tomorrow.